uh, Advent Sunday with you. Uh, when we're planning for something that is important, we think about every detail because we want it to go well. For instance, when getting ready for an important race at something like the Olympics, athletes from many countries arrive many weeks early so that they can adjust to the time zone and be at their peak condition. At that point, every aspect of their training, their resting, their eating, even their socializing is carefully evaluated. And their gear when they're competing is often the best that money can buy, and it fits perfectly, of course. However, when Jim Thorpe represented the United States in the 1912 Summer Olympics in Stockholm, he did not have much support. When he was getting ready to start the decathlon, he discovered that someone had stolen his track shoes. Instead of panicking, he asked around, and he found that some of the athletes had shoes that they were going to throw away. One guy had an undamaged left shoe, and he found an undamaged right shoe in the trash. One of the shoes was a size too big, so he just got extra socks so that it would fit. Wearing mismatched shoes, Jim was able to dominate the 10 events of the decathlon, calmly setting a world record and beating the silver medalist by 688 points. As he presented Jim with a gold medal, King Gustav V of Sweden called him the greatest athlete in the world. When facing hardships, Jim kept on competing. He was born into poverty on an Indian reservation in Oklahoma. His twin brother died when he was nine. He was an orphan by 13. Growing up, he faced poverty. As a Native American, he faced discrimination and loss after loss. But he kept going because he put his trust in his own physical prowess. By dominating in sports, he was able to keep succeeding at life. After the Olympics, he made a good living playing baseball, basketball, and football professionally. However, when old age finally caught up with him and forced him to retire from professional sports, he suffered from alcoholism and depression. Jim Thorpe spent his final years poor, sued by his ex-wives and his children for child support, and he had to rely on charity to pay his hospital bills. I believe Jim's life teaches us about the potential and the limitation of trusting in our abilities. When we believe in ourselves, we are able to overcome momentary setbacks. When he was in his prime, you couldn't sideline Jim Thorpe by taking his shoes. Even barefoot, he would still beat you with his superior skills. However, when our resilience is based on our ability, then we will eventually experience a crisis of confidence and a crisis of identity. Because we are all mortal. Our minds and our bodies will fail us. Our network will constantly shrink. Our resources will run out and I find my metabolism will continually slow down. When we have nothing left in ourselves to cling to, what can we do? Our only hope for an eternal resilience is the gospel. In today's passage, we see the imperfect circumstances that surrounded the birth of Jesus. And Joseph and Mary did not overcome these hardships with the power of positive thinking or by focusing on their strengths. They overcame by faith in the God who is mighty to save. May that faith live in all of us today. Would you join me in prayer? God, as we turn to your word, would you help us to say, when I'm worn down, when my willpower runs out, I want to trust in you. Keep our eyes on you so that our joy and our hope will not fail. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be made holy and pleasing unto you. For in Jesus' name we pray. God's word for us today comes from Luke chapter 2. Uh, today we'll be reading from verses 1 through 7. Next week we'll do the next chunk of Luke chapter 2 and we'll, find, uh, we'll finish out the year uh, with the last of Luke chapter 2 at the 31st. Beginning with verse 1. At that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. 
He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. This is the word of the Lord. Let me list some of the things that are going wrong for Mary and for Joseph. First of all, they were born as members of a conquered nation ruled by the Roman Empire. This means that she had to follow the emperor's decrees whether she wanted to or not, as we see in verses 1 to 3. At that time, the Roman emperor, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all returned to their own ancestor homes to register for the census. Being counted for a census meant that they had to break Jewish law. If you remember in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, King David took a census to get a sense of how much money and how much fighting men he could gather from his country for his own agenda, and he was punished by God severely. So the Jews knew that they were supposed to serve God's agenda, not the plans of some earthly king. And to remember that they existed for God, they were only supposed to conduct the census when God commanded it through the prophets. And they tried to explain their religious rationale to the Roman Empire. However, Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire, and the Israelites did not get an exception. And according to the Jewish historian Josephus, when Quirinius was the governor of Syria and demanded that the Jews be counted in the census, a man named Judas of Galilee led a small uprising, and this rebellion led to the formation of the party that became known as the Zealots, the freedom fighters who wanted to resist the Roman Empire by any means necessary. However, the high priest at the time, a man named Joazar, who eventually became the leader of the Sadducees, he was able to convince most of the Israelites to comply with the census and also the paying of the tax to the Roman Empire. The point I want to make just for today is that Mary had to suffer the indignity and inconvenience of being a member of a conquered nation. As an Israelite, she was one of the losers and had to do what the winners commanded. And this included having to travel for the sake of the census. In those times, most people could only travel about 20 miles in a day. And the trip for Mary and Joseph was 90 miles south from Nazareth along the flatlands of the Jordan River, and then west over the hills surrounding Jerusalem and on into Bethlehem. In the winter, the Judean roads were often muddy with rain, and at night it would drop below freezing. Scholars estimate that Joseph and Mary likely would have traveled only 10 miles a day at most, and probably spent up to two weeks on this grueling trip. But the discomfort was not just physical. Let's go to verse 4. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. So verse 4 tells us that Bethlehem was where Joseph has family. If you were Mary, would you want to hang out with your in-laws for an extended period of time? I imagine she would much prefer to stay with her own parents in Nazareth, especially given verse 5. He took with them Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. So Mary is pregnant. Just that fact by itself makes travel almost prohibitive, prohibitively difficult. But also consider that Mary is engaged and not yet married, and the baby that she carries is not Joseph's son. On top of the physical toil of going to Bethlehem, there is a huge social and psychological burden. Mary is meeting Joseph's extended family for the first time. There's going to be a lot of questions. People are going to make a lot of assumptions, perhaps throw around many accusations. After just having gone through the same process in Nazareth, Mary dreads facing more of the same in Bethlehem. 
most women are scared at their first birth. They want to control the conditions as much as possible, like an Olympic athlete getting ready for an important race. But Mary has to travel 90 miles in her final weeks before giving birth. She arrives dirty, tired, and desperate at her in-law's home. Mary has much to complain and worry about. Imperfect circumstances. Let's shift for a moment and consider what Joseph experienced as imperfect. Verse 6 tells us that due to Joseph's planning and effort, he managed to barely get Mary to Bethlehem so that she didn't have to give birth on the side of the road. And while they were there in Bethlehem, the time came for her baby to be born. For that to happen, for the baby not to be born on the way, think about how much Joseph had to carry on his back. Supplies for two weeks on the road. He probably sweated through his clothes every day because I'm sure he wasn't dividing the luggage. All right, some for me, some for you, Mary. Let's all share the load together. He was probably carrying everything. He put it all on his back to make it as easy as possible for her. Think about all the variables that he's considering in his mind. The condition of the road, the safety from bandits, the timing of every travel. He has to finish the journey before the baby arrives, but keep Mary rested enough so as to not trigger a premature birth. When he has to go through all of this hardship, Joseph doesn't give up or shut down because he was dealt a difficult hand. Despite imperfect circumstances, Joseph continues to do his best to support and provide for his family. Where does that motivation and resilience and strength come from. It doesn't come from Joseph. Matthew's gospel tells us that after he discovered that Mary was pregnant, Joseph just wanted to give up. He thought that the best that he could do was just walk away without getting overly angry. But in a dream, after he had thought, all right, I'm giving up on this possible marriage, giving up on family with Mary, in a dream through an angel, God tells Joseph that the strange child growing in Mary's womb is not the ruin of his life, but is the savior of the world. And Joseph is commanded to believe Mary, to love Mary, and to love her son. And this is an overwhelming assignment. How can you control your emotions when seeing the baby grow within Mary triggers feelings of betrayal and doubt? How could he keep the dread and doubt from growing within his heart, leading him to panic? None of us have the willpower to control our feelings and our thoughts completely. But God knows what Joseph needs. Joseph, who already had the overwhelming task of ignoring the gossip, overcoming his doubts and loving Mary and Jesus, is given another overwhelming task of making sure they make this long trip to Bethlehem safely. This second responsibility, it keeps Joseph's mind from drifting into doubt and panic. Every step of that 90-mile journey, Joseph is having to remember, I'm doing this for my family that God has called me to love. So the toil of the journey purifies his heart. It focuses his mind. It centers his soul. Because sometimes God puts a crisis on top of a crisis because it's sometimes easier to bear two burdens rather than one. Because when you just have one burden, we try to bear it with our own strength. But when a burden falls on top of another burden, we know we can't do it. And that's when we have to depend totally on God. I think that Mary can say the same about how God's plan is somehow perfect, despite the circumstances being so imperfect. Mary can also say that God is the one who turns crisis into a blessing. Mary is the one with the more overwhelming calling. After giving her yes to God, she had to give her body to a fetus that gives her morning sickness. She has to give her testimony to people who give her incredulous stares. 
And at the end of a physically and emotionally grueling journey, she has to give birth. Give, give, give. And after giving birth, Mary does not receive a halo. She is shaken, sweating, bleeding, and scared. Giving to God does not make Mary feel triumphant. It makes her depleted. Friends, who among us can most understand Mary? It's the one with the heaviest load who's getting the least recognition. It's the person who's putting in the heroic effort but haunted by the feeling that there's still a burden. Someone is giving their all but still slipping more into debt. You said yes to God, thinking that it would be empowering, but it's just been exhausting. Instead of leading a mighty movement, as you imagined, you're stuck with a lot of lonely moments. All you can do is do your best. But tears come to your eyes because your best looks inadequate. And I think this is the fear that plagues Mary. I must be doing something wrong. This can't be what God wanted. I believe Mary felt that in verse 7. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth, laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. After giving birth, most moms that I know, they lean back to catch a breath as the doctor takes the baby away. Later on, the nurses bring the baby back, washed and wrapped in the blanket, and then the baby is just placed in the mother's chest. But after giving birth, there is no one to whom Mary can give this baby. She has to do the best that she can, whispering for Joseph to go and get those strips of cloth and then wrapping up Jesus snug. With trembling hands, Mary provides tender care. But after she lays the baby in this recently cleaned out animal feeding trough, I'm sure she thinks, this isn't right. There's no way that this is what God wanted me to do. I must have done something wrong along the way. That's the pain that Mary has to carry. After giving her all, she still feels that it's all wrong. So what allows Mary to keep going even when her circumstances are so imperfect? When her best feels inadequate, how can she maintain joy and courage? The answer I found is in verse 12, which is actually a part of next week's reading, so I'm cheating. There the angels tell the shepherds to go worship Jesus and tell them they will recognize the Savior in the following way. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. This is something that nobody does, but they're saying this unique sign will let you know that this is the right home, the home where the baby that is the savior of the world is born. So the shepherds make their way to Mary, and they share with Mary, we have to worship here because of what the angels told them. And when Mary hears what the angels told the shepherds, she realizes, I have been in the will of God during all these weeks that I was second-guessing myself. The thing that she thought was inadequate was exactly, was actually exactly what God wanted her to do. The time that she felt helpless was actually a time when all of heaven was watching and cheering for her. Wrapping the baby in strips of cloth and laying him in a manger, it was not a mistake because through the fellowship of others who are there to worship Jesus, Mary receives encouragement and that's how she perseveres. Friends, the standards of our world, it oppresses us. You will feel guilty every time you take a rest. You will feel inadequate even when you do your best. And when we are struggling, because we feel this judgment from the world, we are tempted to hold up and hide. Even if we motivate ourselves enough to get out to a party this holiday season, we will still have difficulty getting our hearts to engage. This winter break, all of us will be tempted 
to settle for days off with strong drink on our lips, meaningless music in our ears, Mariah Carey singing for the thousandth time, for the thousandth year, it seems, and unwrapped boxes at our feet. That's what we're tempted to settle for, but we are called to want more. We are called to hang out with the people who worship Jesus. And through fellowship, we're reminded that God accepts us and celebrates us and frees us from our anxiety and shame about our performance. So when your pictures seem to mid for Instagram, when your impact on the world seems muted, when the world seems to see you as mediocre, know that God doesn't compare you to anyone else. God knows. God knows when you swallow your pride and hold back on your anger. God knows when you're gathering strength to serve, when you're doing your best to smile. Even when it's mixed with doubts, God knows when you're trying to offer faith. Even if circumstances make it so that strips of cloth and a cleaned-out manger are all that you have to offer Jesus, God still celebrates your giving. And friends, these are the secrets to a faith-fueled resilience. Like Joseph, we must trust that when God gives work on top of work, burden on top of burden, so that it's not possible for us to do it, that God is in control. And God is giving us that extra burden to remind us that we have to depend entirely on him. Like Mary, we must trust that even when our best looks foolishly inadequate, that God celebrates it and is honored by it. When we keep our eyes on God, we don't just get through the hard times. We will discover that these imperfect circumstances are the ways that we can have the greatest intimacy with God. With that in mind, would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you. We thank you for the example of Joseph and Mary who teach us how to celebrate Christmas right. They show us that celebrating Christmas right is not about doing better than their neighbors. It's about keeping their eyes on you and trusting you. I pray that you would make us like Joseph. When we feel that it's unfair, because you are giving to us a struggle on top of a struggle so that there's no way we could do a good job. I pray, O oh God, that like Joseph discovered, would you help us to discover that this is a blessing in disguise, that by putting us in impossible situations, you're teaching us to depend on you. You are taking away every bit of our free time. You're taking away every ounce of our energy so that we can learn to be purified, to be able to stand right before you. Instead of complaining that we're doing more than others, would you help us to recognize that for this season, this is what you've ordained, so that we can learn to depend on you. God, would you help us to be like Mary, when it seems like our best is inadequate, when the world, even our loved ones, Look and say, our best is inadequate. Would you help us to hear from heaven that you are looking upon our life with acceptance, even celebration, and that you are saying, I watch you, and I'm honored by you, and I choose to be loved by you. As you celebrate the little that we offer, I pray, O oh God, that our hearts will open up with gratitude, and with true worship that keeps us going. And I pray, O oh God, that you would help us to be encouragers of one another, reminding us what it means to celebrate Christmas so that we will have praise on our lips, we'll have love in our hearts in each day of the season. These things we pray in Christ's name.